Hello, and welcome to the second session in the Alliance's 2021 Signature Series Summit on Health and the Economy. I am Kate Sullivan Hare, Vice President of Policy and Communications at the Alliance. You can join today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AHPSummit21, and you can follow us at All Health Policy. We really want you to be active participants, so please get your questions ready. Here's how you do it. Please navigate yourself to the chat box on your screen. You can use this feature to submit questions to panelists, as well as to seek support for any audio or technical issues you may be experiencing. Materials for this event are available below for download, and a recording will be available here on Eventia at the conclusion of the webinar. Now, I am pleased to introduce today's panelists. First, we are joined by Dr. Lisa Dubay, Senior Fellow in the Health Policy Center at Urban Institute. Dr. Dubay is a nationally recognized expert on Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, and has spent over 25 years evaluating the effects of public policies on access to care, healthcare utilization, health outcomes, and health insurance coverage using quasi and experimental designs. Previously, Dr. DeBay was Associate Professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and served as Special Advisor in the Office of Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at HHS. Next, we are joined by Susanna Haltine, Program Director of the Employment Law and Retirement Program of the National Conference of State Legislatures. In this role, Suzanne oversees issues around employment, occupational licensing, and workforce development. Prior to joining NCSL, Suzanne served as Deputy Chief of Staff for two Lieutenant Governors in the state of Colorado, where she worked on issues ranging from early childhood education to higher education and workforce development. Next, I'd like to introduce Shayla Thompson, Government Affairs Manager at the National Employment Law Project. Shayla supports NELP's efforts to create and support policies and campaigns that uplift black and brown workers through legislative advocacy, research, and testimony. During her time with NELP, Shayla has overseen projects committed to racial equity, healthful and safe workplaces, and facilitating equity training. Finally, I'm so pleased to be joined by Evan Armstrong, Vice President of Government Affairs at the Retail Industry Leaders Association. In his role at RELA, Evan leads advocacy efforts related to workforce and employment issues before Congress and federal agencies, including the Department of Labor, the EEOC, and NLRB. In addition, Evan explores how the evolutions in the future of work impact the retail industry and develops work policy strategies to build the 21st century retail workforce. We're so glad you all could join us for this important discussion today. And I'd like to start us off with an opening question. How have you been defining or identifying essential workers in your work? Who are these workers? What do they do? What is the nuance that we should keep in mind when we're thinking of the descriptor essential? Lisa, let's start with you. Okay, um, thanks Kate, it's great to be here. So I, when I think about who are the essential workers, um, both who they are, um, the extent of exposure to COVID that they faced at work and what protections that were offered to them. And when we get, and when they got access to the vaccine, all of these things depended importantly on the um, public health and other policies of the state that they lived in, the industry they worked in. And um, because worker protections were not universal, um, the employers that they worked for. So I wanna sort of keep that in mind as we, as we talk about um, who these essential workers are. Um, but I wanna talk today about the work that we did on essential workers at the Urban Institute. And this work was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So very early on in the pandemic, it was really clear that COVID-19 was not affecting all people equally. So we were really interested in whether the occupational segregation that results from systemic racism was leading to differential exposure to the coronavirus at work. So we set about to explore this. And as we all know, there are a lot of complexities to who is an essential worker. Um, there are a broad group of workers, both within an industry, for example, they include neurosurgeons and hospital janitors working in the healthcare industry. They also um, vary across industries with essential workers, including 
those that pick the fruits and vegetables we eat and the people who are making sure that the net's working so we can have this virtual session today. And so overall, workers in essential industries comprise about 60% of workers in the country. Um, but not all workers who are essential were at increased exposure to the coronavirus at work during the pandemic. Um, some types of essential workers, for example, many psychologists and lawyers could mostly work virtually from home. And others you know, who were not deemed essential, such as restaurant workers, I assume many people had takeout during the early months of the pandemic, these workers um, continued to work through the stay at home orders. Um, so what we did actually was to look at workers in essential industries who had to work in person and in close proximity to others. These were the workers that we sort of um, felt were keeping society functioning during the stay at home orders and beyond, and who were most at risk for, of contracting COVID at work. Um, but we also looked at non-essential workers who often faced similar working conditions because as soon as states started to reopen, many of these workers returned to work um, to provide services to us like the likes of haircuts, non-essential retail shopping and restaurant dining. And no one was really focused on um, these workers, um, these non-essential workers. And we thought that was important. And what we found was that there was a clear patterning by race showing greater potential for exposure to um, COVID at work for Black, Hispanic, and Native American workers compared to um, white and Asian workers. So specifically, we found that about 27% of all workers had jobs in essential industries that needed to work in person and in close proximity to others. However, um, while a quarter of white and Asian workers had such jobs, fully a third or more of Black, Hispanic, and Native American workers had, had jobs that placed them at risk. And then when we considered both the essential and non-essential workers, um, we, we found that 45% of all the workers had jobs um, that had to be done in person or in close proximity to others. And similarly to the essential workers, about 40% of white and Asian workers had this type of job compared to about 50% of Black. Hispanic and Native American workers. So what else did we know about learn about these essential workers who had to work in person and in close proximity and basically allowed us to stay safe in our homes? Um, they're mostly economically uh, disadvantaged. Um, they're more economically disadvantaged than other workers um, with lower wages um, on average and um, much higher rates of uninsurance. Um, and they also faced other exposure risks such as the greater likelihood of relying on um, public transportation to get to work and living in multi-generational households. And across um, these dimensions, um, Black, Hispanic, and Native American workers faced um, greater economic vulnerability and greater exposure to non-employment risks than the white and Asian workers. And, and finally, the non-essential workers were the most vulnerable along all of these dimensions. So I just sort of want to, after that preview, just say, you know, these workers, the, both the essential and the non-essential, we're really risking exposure to COVID and allowing many of us to stay safe at, um, and work from home with little risk of exposure. And yet, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, financial and health protections for these workers were really not comprehensive and they very much varied by state and left many um, unprotected. I really appreciate uh, that's a terrific way to sort of level set and I um, value hearing uh, how you've described everybody. Um, Suzanne, what's your take on this just on this question? Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, I'll kind of jump into some of our resources that we provided around essential workers and, and really at the National Conference of State Legislatures, when that first wave of stay at home orders and, and shelter in place orders were implemented back in early 2020, a lot of it was initially taken up by local governments in terms of determining who should stay at home and sh who should stay at work. And quickly, um, states realized that that this should be something that um, that they need to determine. And so typically through executive orders from governor's offices, uh, they determined what businesses are considered essential and needed to remain open. And NCSL tracked uh, these orders in all 50 states um, and a, a lot of them, a lot of states relied on some of the, the federal guidance that was provided through the uh, U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, which is under the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and some states 
use that exclusively in determining what who is an essential worker. Um, and other states kind of based it off of that and then expanded um, who was considered an essential worker. So a, a lot of the occupations overlapped, obviously those in healthcare um, fields, um, energy, water, wastewater, childcare, uh, agriculture and food production. Um, again, those in, in kind of those um, critical retail such as grocery store hardware workers. Um, but then we also saw some differences among states. Um, so some states included nonprofits or religious organizations that provided direct care to certain people People, um, think of food pantries, for example. Uh, and then some states also included some of the workers in the cannabis industry as well. And we did see over the course of the last uh, 15 months or so, there were some changes in who was uh, deemed an essential worker and, and who was not in the states. And I, a lot of states started to um, fall a little bit more in line with some of the, the federal guidance. Um, but again, there were some variances in the state. And I, I think we'll get a little bit more into the, the vaccine distribution and um, those definitions in a little bit. But, um, but that's how we were tracking it at NCSL. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, Shayla, I'd love to hear from you. Yes, thanks, Kate. Um, at NELP, we, we really identify all workers as essential in our work uh, with the principle that all working people that are com contributing to community survival or our infrastructure are, or our economy are essential. We use that as a guiding principle. But we also consider the Labor Department essential worker identifiers in the Wage and Hour Division, which I'm sure so many of us are familiar with. Uh, they recognize workers in agriculture, healthcare, grocery, delivery services, first responders, public transportation, restaurants, construction, security, hotel, uh, landscaping, and janitorial as essential. And you know, these workers, they're providing healthcare and emergency services, doing farm and ag work, their parents, their caretakers, uh, they provide education, their cashiers and their servers, they deliver our goods, they transport our waste, their service reps, their drivers and their pilots. And just like Lisa uh, just mentioned, uh, due to structural racism, essential workers are segregated by race, class and gender. And the pandemic really amplified how this segregation has created a divided workforce, putting women, Black, Latinx, and immigrant people in the most dangerous jobs, but also as the majority of workers on the front lines of the pandemic. So consequently, these essential workers are disproportionately women. Uh, in fact, women make up about 90% of childcare workers, 66% of grocery store workers, and 70% of wait staff. These essential workers are disproportionately black and brown. They're often immigrants and underpaid and oftentimes misclassified. So they don't have the employee protections or standards that full-time workers may receive. And I think that the nuance that we should keep in mind when thinking of essential is really the working people that keep our communities afloat, workers that contributed to our infrastructure that allowed communities to survive during the pandemic should be, should be deemed essential uh, even after we get back to whatever the new normal will soon be, uh, we at now we've really grounded our advocacy uh, in the principle that worker health is public health, and when we fail to protect workers, our health and all of our well-being is threatened. In many of the outbreaks that occurred in workplaces, it's spread into neighborhoods and communities. So as we move out of this uh, COVID era, we should continue to hold the value of the workers that maintain the country as a crucible of what being an essential worker is in quote unquote normal times. Great, thank you so much, Shayla. And Evan, let's hear from you. Sure, well, appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, I think our industry, the retail industry, you know, played a, a vital role uh, throughout the pandemic. You know, obviously as uh, folks were hunkered down in their houses, they still needed to get the goods they needed, uh, whether it was grocery or, uh, office supplies uh, as they were setting up new op uh, offices in their bedrooms uh, at home. Uh, so again, I think retail really prides itself in being a leader and being a crucial component of uh, this process of getting through the pandemic. Uh, and it, a lot of it has to do with uh, the frontline essential retail workers that uh, by and large continue to work. You know, I think one one critique I have, and I think we have worked uh, very diligently on over the last year, is really getting away from designations of 
versus non-essential because in the initial fog of the pandemic in uh, you know April of last year, you know we were dealing with a seemingly arbitrary uh, designation of essential versus non-essential. You know some products were deemed essential, some were not, and that really impacted our members uh, who some had to shut down completely for a period of time. And so you know that was a difficulty for our industry and. I'm, I'm sure Suzanne can attest, you know, the, the, the myriad of various uh, standards, mandates, and regulations across the, the country were a challenge. Uh, but I think once we got through that and retail was fully opened, you know, there was a tremendous amount of investment from our companies to make sure that the workers who were getting the goods to people who needed them uh, were protected with PPE, were provided uh, as much health and safety protocols as possible. And I think the uh, standards that the retail community set, whether it was mask mandates or now vaccine, vaccination policies, um, you know, I think we're really proud of. So again, the, the essential workers were, were crucial to making sure the economy continued to run. Um, and now, you know, we're obviously uh, hopefully um, confident in getting everything reopening and, and getting, you know, back to uh, whatever, the, as Sheila said, the, the normal uh, world uh, as we get past this pandemic. Indeed. I think we all are looking for some semblance of a pre-pandemic normal, but it's going to take a long time to get there. Um, you know, thank you all of you for setting the stage. And I'd really like to dive into some follow-up questions. Um, at this time, I'd like to remind the audience that you can submit your own questions to us via the chat box. Um, one question um, is, that um, a lot of different terminology has been used to define workers who worked on site during the pandemic. Is there a difference between essential workers and frontline workers? And are there other descriptors that should be used as well? So for, for us in the retail industry, pre-pandemic, you know, typically the terminology that was used was frontline workers if you were you know, speaking about in-store uh, associates or team members or, or even uh, your folks in the supply chain and around di distribution centers and warehouses. So again, that's the terminology we were using and we'd like to continue to use that because, you know, ultimately, you know, drawing a line between who's essential and not, I think is, is not really as productive as, as, we, as it should be. And, and so again, you know, I, I, the designation we try not to use. Mm -hmm. Others? I mean, I, I would echo that. I mean, in, in some ways, I think the frontline workers are a subset of the essential workers. But then at the same time, there are all these um, people that um, are working on the front line in the sense that they have to go into their off in, in, t in person and they are working close to other people that are not in essential industries. And they're at they're at the same risk of exposure. You know, whether you work in a department store or a grocery store, you're you're equally exposed. And one of those workers is considered essential. One of them isn't. I think that that, that differential when you're you're thinking about. I mean, I think it depends on what you're talking about. You know, are you, you know, during the stay at home, it's stay at home periods. We really just wanted the essential workers to to be to be out there making society work. But as we reopened, um, the, these other frontline workers were making things convenient for everybody, but also risking their lives. And so I think um, to call them not essential is, is, is really, it's, it's not fair and they deserve the same kind of protections that the essential workers deserve. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think looking back, uh, initially teachers weren't considered essential in a lot of states because, um, because you know, school was put on hold for a while. And I think it's just, it's just really interesting how it's all evolved and, and to Lisa's point earlier about 60% of the workforce being considered essential. I mean, that's the majority. Um, does it make sense to kind of designate them essential when it's such a, a large population really? And that's a good, it's a good distinction. I wanted to uh, ask because I recall that when the vaccines were starting to roll out, that that's, um, there was again some definition around who should get these first. Um, can you tell us more about how frontline and essential workers fit into sort of those initial categories of people? How were they prioritized if, if, if they were at all? I think um, really quickly to jump in, you know, similar to how earlier in the pandemic, just the definition of essential kind of, um, and those occupations changed. I think same thing with um, with the vaccinations. Uh, 
there's some good resources out there kind of defining, you know, how states categorize them and what phase they were all in. Um, and I think it's interesting, and I think I'd love to hear more from Evan on this point, but I think some of those retail workers that were initially at the very start considered essential, um, sometimes were kind of put further down that uh, vaccination list. And so I think, um, and it, you know, teachers might've been bumped up a little bit. So I, I think, I mean, I'd love to hear from Evan, just sorry to put you on the spot, but um, you know, the, the priorities definitely changed. Right, it, it, it was a, a struggle uh, and, and again, every jurisdiction was a bit different in how they defined certain categories. And so again, that was a struggle just like it was last year with uh, whether you were, be, were able to stay open or not. And I do think some of those priorities were shifted a bit and certainly I think schools was one area where that happened. Um, but you know, we argued obviously that as retail was continually operating, all of our members, our associates should be really top of the list because they are, they are out there. They are providing services and keeping the economy moving. So we, we made those arguments very strongly and, you know, thankfully now we're in a, a moment where everybody, uh, you know, has access to the vaccine and should go get it. There's my PSA, uh, go get the vaccine. <laughs> and, 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 and our members are really promoting that with their, their employees. Let me ask about some of the uh, on-site workforce protections that you know, for these uh, frontline workers, these essential workers, um, would you like to talk about sort of what is it that um, employers were doing sort of real time as we were still learning the science? Is it large water droplets? Is it small uh, aerosolized uh, droplets? Uh, what is, you know, what do, what happens with all that plexiglass? Um, but what is it that employers have done, needed to do, you know, ref reflecting back on this past 12 months um, to keep their employee, those frontline workers safe while learning this real time? It's a, it's a great point. I think um, this is, that's the baseline point that everybody should, should recognize is that the information has changed continuously uh, for 14 months. And so our member companies and every, uh, you know, employer operating, every organization has had to stay nimble. Uh, so something that RELA member companies did uh, and RELA convened uh, weekly meetings with high level retail executives to continually develop best practices and toolkits uh, for folks to operate in the best way, right? So you go into a grocery store and you saw plexiglass and you saw the arrows pointing one way down the aisles. I mean, those are protocols developed at the highest level in the retail industry. And I think that process continues to this day as we continually get new information. And, you know, that's one of the arguments that we've made about continuing the guidance process rather than coming in with a mandated um, health and wellness uh, ordinance. So I think, again, because the information is new and it changes and evolves, we have to evolve with it. And our protocols have done that over the last 14 months. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Jump in. Um, we do have a question from the audience uh, about long-term care workers those who work in residential settings and uh, in the home of both frontline, um, they're both frontline and essential. Um, many died while caring for our nation's older adults. Can you speak to how your organization addressed uh, this population? And if anyone has done any work, of, especially in the long-term care industry. Certainly, it's. Um, I, I know frontline work. Those frontline workers were very, uh, even in these congregate care settings, were unable to get PPE at the very beginning, and were unable, um, and then risked uh, bringing, the, uh, uh, it's exposing themselves during their commute and within the long-term care setting, uh, as well as going back to their own homes. but none of your organizations has it. Um, one is, another segment that, out, that was out there that we saw a lot of growth, um, and it, or it certainly seemed that as people left restaurants, they became uh, Uber Eats drivers or other platforms, um, Postmates uh, delivering workers. But what protections are there for uh, the gig economy workers uh, that were working out there sort of on their own um, and receiving information from their platform technologies. 
I'll just jump in really quickly on the gig worker. You know, I think more broadly um, with the early um, early CARES Act and, and FERCA from um, the federal government obviously provided that unemployment insurance for, for gig workers, which was something that was completely new. And, um, you know, I think it'll be really interesting just to see from at NCSL, we're, we're kind of looking to see if any states are looking on taking up some of those, um, you know, security nets for gig workers uh, in the future. So that's something that we're definitely tracking. And I, I think it will be interesting. But I, I think, you know, beyond the unemployment insurance, I think they were not eligible for sort of the, um, the two the two weeks of sick leave. Um, and, you know, that was just that was only available to um, employ to employees of employers between 50 and 500 employees. And so there are a lot of workers that were were left out of those protections. And so um, particularly with these low wage um, essential workers that made people be in this in uh, make a choice between going going to work if you don't feel well or, or not. And it really um, probably, you know, that lack of um, that that lack of resources for so many of those workers really probably yeah, you know, spread the, um, the the virus you know further than it needed to be had those protections been in place. And that's a good question, Shayla. I was wondering if you could talk to us. Are there other previous workplace protections that may not have applied uh, in pandemic circumstances? Uh, traditional work where were things waived at all or not enforced? Yeah, so uh, pre-pandemic, you know, the Occupational Safety and Health um, Administration is really tasked with workplace safety and health. And, you know, advocates really pushed for an emergency temporary standard to have like clear uh, preventative measures for employers as well as uh, workers. Um, you know, unfortunately, workplace health and safety rights are very weak, and um, there there is some some enforcement that was done under uh, the general duty clause of, of, of the OPT Act. And we did see some some very minimal fines um, issued in very um, essential industries like meat and poultry, but they were a very small fraction um, compared to what a lot of the companies are worth. So I think that moving forward, as we kind of come come, we're slowly getting towards the other side of the pandemic. Um, that may change because we are experiencing a vaccine rollout. However, you know, even the new CDC guidance, it doesn't really um, specify how to mitigate measures within the workplace. So although we do have some pre-pandemic uh, protections in place from the Department of Labor, they are not enough and they don't go far enough. The agency has always been very small, very understaffed. It's been all time low as far as investigators in 2019. Um, it would take over 150 years for every investigator to get into a workplace just once. And, and that was pre-pandemic. So I, just like someone just alluded to, I think we really need to uh, focus on some permanent protections that folks can use and also things like, you know, uh, a private right of action or uh, anti-retaliation measures for workers that aren't receiving, you know, best practices on the job. Mm -hmm. I want to say something also about um, just the sick leave policy because I think, I think now that it is getting in the way of some um, some people actually getting the vaccine. The Kaiser Family Foundation's done some um, some polling on this of those that that don't have that haven't gotten the vaccine yet, and many of them say large percentages of them say I can't take time off from work or I'm worried about being sick and not being able to work. And so I think this, this universal protection of having some sick leave is, is really, I mean, I think it's getting, the lack of it is getting in the way of um, some people actually getting the vaccine. I, she's not a frontline worker by any stretch of the imagination, but I have a middle school student who is extremely pr protective of her grade point average and has been putting off getting her second inoculation precisely for waiting for the last day of school. <laughs> she is not, she did not want to take any chances like her older sister and um, not feel well the second day. So, so that's a very real issue, Lisa. Um, 
and there were provisions put in place to um, for employers um, to uh, both in the CARES Act and some other things. Evan, can you remind us a little bit about what is it that was provided to employers as far as incentives uh, for for looking out for their employees and uh, the things such as time off or other perks? Yes, yeah, so, so the CARES Act did uh, you know, require employers uh, with employees between 50 and 500 so uh, to offer leave, uh, but then there was a, a tax credit uh, that those employers could apply for to recoup the costs of that. Um, RELA members are all over 500 employees, so it wasn't something that our members uh, were impacted by. However, they all took the last 14 months very seriously and uh, by and large all provided robust leave options. Uh, and then as it relates to the vaccine, uh, a number of our companies, if not the majority of them, offer paid time off uh, so folks can go get the vaccine. If they get sick from the vaccine, they cannot be used for that. Um, again, because the priority uh, for our industry and for our members is to get vaccinations up over that 70%, which is the exact goal for the president as well. Uh, so we are thinking outside the box creatively about what benefits, policies, programs, uh, encouragements can be offered. Uh, and on, on that point, I think the EEOC updated guidelines around vaccinations were, was, was really well received, uh, kind of giving a nudge to employers to be a little bit more proactive. So I think you're going to continually see Mm -hmm. that uh, from the business. Um, I have a question from the audience. Um, we need to stop saying or thinking we are on the other side of the pandemic. Pandemic refers to the global nature of the pandemic. Um, certainly all of you work in the global uh, workplace and uh, American companies are right there. Um, we may be getting a handle on some of the epidemic in the United States, but too many people are not vaccinated. Um, how far, as far as getting back to workplaces, how far would you say that we are to being at sort of a normal or a pre-pandemic level of workforce? It's a, it's a great question. You know, I can say that, um, you know, maybe it's just me in my mind wanting us to get past this uh, too quickly, but there, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, and the vaccination is, is, is the huge step. You know, we had a conversation with our members recently where many of them were stuck around 40 to 45% vaccination rate within their workforce. And this is after quite a bit of, you know, policies and programs to encourage it. So it's a huge effort. Um, and there are these uh, populations that are just a little bit more hesitant to do it. Uh, and I think we have to remove those obstacles and, you know, again, thinking creatively to do that because uh, as the commenter said, we're not through this completely yet and we won't be until we reach that herd immunity and, and where it just becomes sort of a, a managed thing uh, going forward. What about mandates? Employers mandating a vaccine at some point? Any reality to, I know that certainly while there's been emergency use status, there's been some discussion about not wanting to mandate it. So the EEOC has said that you can have, you can have mandatory vaccination programs, but there are pretty rigid guidelines and obviously employers have to be mindful of uh, things like uh, ABADA, uh, about the genome restrictions and, and, and other things that protect privacy and protect workers. Uh, and those are important. Uh, so we're, we are balancing interests here of, you know, getting everybody vaccinated that we can, but also being mindful of existing guardrails that are there for a good reason. Um, so I think this is, this is the balance that we're trying to strike. But again, I think the EEOC is trying to nudge uh, and provide as much cover as they can uh, while acknowledging that there are uh, restrictions in terms of what uh, employers can, um, you know, mandate from their employees as it relates to healthcare policies. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's a whole, just a whole issue. I mean, I'm sitting here in my um, dining room because um, my organization is not open and um, we're really struggling with how to do that and what to, in, you know, whether to do that. And it's, I think getting back to normal is gonna take a long time. And I think, I think many employers don't know how to create a, a safe environment for their employees. And I think that's, that. I think, we could all use some guidance and help on that. Um, Cause I think many individual, I mean, just from, 
this is again an anecdote, but friends that work in large um, organizations, none of them have gone back yet because they're trying to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, so I think, you know, it's an interesting, it's gonna take a while. Mm -hmm. um, just curious, um, if we have a pandemic or a major natural disaster in the future, how might we consider essential workers in the future? Uh, do you think there will be proactive guidance at all? I mean, I think, I think this year, year and a half is definitely equipped, at least from, from my perspective and our, our work at NCSL, equipped policymakers to be better prepared for um, in helping their workers and what workers need. I think it's, it's evident had alluded to, you know, this was like, we were learning, everyone was learning, you know, all along. And so um, from the policymaker perspective, I think they're more equipped to, um, to just be prepared and um, for workers and um, in the future. And I, I don't know what that looks like, whether it is kind of that, that leave um, flexibility, the, um, and other types of flexibilities. I mean, I, I think the other thing that this pandemic uh, it, it was just so very different from previous recessions in general and in the people that it impacted mostly. And so, um, you know, I, I would hope that it was a learning experience for all and they are more prepared. Um, I have a question specifically about mothers, um, especially because of there's conflicting guidance around pregnant women being eligible for vaccines, um, young children uh, for whom they're caregivers who are not yet eligible. Um, how are and you know, we've seen that there's been sort of this loss of women from the workplace, certainly you know, while schools were still not fully opened in um, many in uh, pockets of the nation. Uh, can you ask any, can any of you speak to some, something specifically around women and particularly anything you might be doing to attract women back to the work? Well, I, I can quickly just mention, like like I said earlier, that, you know, um, women are disproportionately on the front lines of the pandemic, but also are the breadwinners in most households. And, you know, child care is a huge issue. Um, we've seen a lot of advocacy for um, not just parents, but also uh, domestic workers and, and rights that include things like paid leave and health and safety and other benefits. And um, I think the pandemic really exposed how uh, inequitable uh, essential work is, especially when we see women and women in color, women of color overrepresented uh, in, these place, in these spaces. So I think these proposals that we're seeing that are really focused on centering women and women of color are always a priority for workers and advocates and, and certainly parents and policymakers. Uh, but I think the pandemic put some urgency behind them and made them realize how essential women also are um, to uh, traditional work, but also as uh, okay. I'll add that we're, you know, I think there's some opportunities with the stimulus funding with the um, American Rescue Plan and, and how uh, states can maybe look at workforce development type programs that get some of these demographics into the workplace. So we've already seen a couple states look at uh, legislation, specifically um, apprenticeship programs or job training programs or reemployment programs that look at these demographics, women in the workplace, but but other also other demographics that may have been impacted, especially hard by the pandemic. And, and then I also think that if schools are back in session in September, that will make a huge difference for for many parents, <laughs> men, men and women. I think we're all looking forward to having people come back voluntarily, those, especially those who have been sort of trapped at home with a five-year-old. Um, the ones who may be the hardest to adjust, is, as I've already seen, going back to the office has been my dog. Uh, you know, and the occasional cicada has not been enough to uh, keep him happy and amused after being, having everyone around for 14 months. But seriously, um, you know, how did how did we get to a point where people in society's health have become so politicized, uh, including the economic impact of the pandemic? Um, yes, we need to protect businesses and individual livelihood. Um, and, but this audience member wants to know that this has led to a huge battle of health versus economics and 
economics versus health. How do we, how do, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be this trade-off, doesn't need to be political. Hmm. Well, the short answer is no, it, it absolutely does not have to be uh, uh, for sure. And it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. And I think that, um, you know, really understanding that like worker rights are human rights. And again, that like worker health is public health and that we are all interconnected. Um, so when, when workers and, and employers and businesses don't have safeguards, it's important at all. But also, you know, a lot of the labor policy that is inequitable and flawed today is working as it was designed many, many decades ago. Um, and I think that the intentional like exclusion of people of color in the creation of our labor laws going all the way back to the New Deal is really affecting us now today. And this exacerbated that. Exacerbated has been my favorite word over the past year or two because it really just like brought everything, amplified everything that was already in place. And unfortunately it was a public health crisis that did that. And no, it should not be politicized. Uh, like Evan said earlier, we are all essential. All of our uh, survival is interconnected and in how we work together is how we survive together. So no, I think that public health and equity should be at the forefront of everything we do, uh, certainly in policies, because when we center certain communities, we all benefit, and, and that's, not type, that's not partisan at all. I, and I also think we need to look more carefully. I mean, like when they say the economic, the, you know, economic impact of the pandemic versus health impacts, the, the populations and groups of people that were most affected by the um, pandemic are those that were also most economically affected by the pandemic. I mean, the people that bore the brunt of the pandemic, most importantly, were um, people of color. And it's, you know, it. I know business owners suffered as well. I mean, I know many business owners who suffered, who lost their businesses. Um, but when you look broadly at who was affected, it was the lowest, in, you know, it's the lowest income people in the country. I mean, many of those those jobs that went away were, you know, low wage work, and those jobs were gone. So, I, and those are the same communities that had the highest. Um, burden of the coronavirus. So I, I understand there's this political issue here, but I think it's it's um, there's something not quite right in the how the questions framed in that regard. Um, just curious about you know as we talk about how how it is that we work, how do we entice people to return to work? Um, you know, as with the word, there's a lot of. Um, especially in large tech companies, for example, is one example where people st still were extremely able to be productive. Um, some of them have said that they don't intend to bring workers back together. Others are saying permanently they're not going to do it. Others can't wait to get back to the office. But how do you think this will change You know, for the white collar uh, worker among us? We, we know about masking, we know about common areas, we know about vaccines. Uh, what else does it take to sort of convince people to leave the comfort of their homes and and you know, dressing dressing down from the waist down uh, to come back to the office? So uh, I'll jump in just because you know I think the retail industry is an is an interesting profile of the broader uh, workforce. We have uh, frontline workers that are in stores. We have uh, distribution center workers, which is more of a traditional manufacturing warehouse uh, scene, and then we also have uh, folks at headquarters. Um, so the policies that our members adopt try to be equitable across the board. And so they were very conscious that headquarter employees were working from home because the states would not allow individuals in offices, but that there were their essential workers or the frontline workers were still operating in the DCs or in the stores. Um, so I think that was always a conscious uh, thing for our member companies. And I think policies going forward will obviously adopt learnings from the pandemic, which is remote remote work can work uh, and more flexibility for workers is, is gonna be the norm, not the exception going forward. 
you know, I can say, you know, my trade association is adopting very flexible programs after Labor Day, we return to work formally. Uh, and I do think that's gonna be the norm across the board. Specifically on how you attract workers back into the workforce, you know, I think the three components that are, um, you know, probably working all in tandem are lack of school, lack of childcare, uh, is probably a huge component. I think the UI benefits have been some of a, a drag on bringing folks back. And I do think that employers need to catch up in, um, you know, whether it's wages, benefits, or other types of inducements to bring these workers in back into the economy. Because until we do that, you know, the economy isn't going to be as robust as it can be. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, it's been thrown around a bunch, but I, I think what a lot of these jobs are going to be looking at is uh, kind of this hybrid workplace where um, it's partially remote and, and partially in person. Um, and I also think the the right now workers have a little bit more of a say in what they want, um, and it's an opportunity for them to, um, you know, engage with their employers on on what would work best for them. So a little bit of a seller's market at this point, um, after after so much of the uh, over the past year. Um, I have a question, another question from the audience. Uh, Latinos were very hard hit because of the level of exposure at work to clients and to other workers. Uh, they are overrepresented in many of the low wage and hourly jobs in our society. How do we address the stratified nature of work in our society and create equitable safety in work environments when we have this different stratification? I think that's um, a million dollar question, right? It may well be. I mean, you know, we have a country that's built on structural racism, these are not accidents. And unless we make some real different changes to how we work and how we value people, there's not gonna be a change. And that needs to, you know, we need political will to do that. We need a, a movement to make those changes because they're, they're not gonna change by themselves. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Yeah, and, and did absolutely ditto to everything that Lisa just said. Um, I think also that, you know, we can't rely on this narrative of individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, equitable policy really looks like um, equity um, through our laws, our policy making, from our institutions, from our government agencies, um, having these communities, communities of color that have been subjugated and discriminated against for generations at the table, having representation. I think over the pandemic, we've seen so much organizing. We've seen workers using their power, using their voices, and workers are telling us what they want. We just have to listen and we have to bring them to the table and let them be a part of crafting the policies that are best going to serve them because when workers thrive, so do businesses, so does the economy. And you know, our economy is about 70% consumer driven. So having uh, standards and protections to uplift workers, but especially workers that have been relegated to the most dangerous and dirtiest jobs is really central to having a more equitable account uh, um, economy and communities, but also like serving us all in, as well as, uh, you know, businesses and the rest of the workforce. Um. I'm just curious to know, and this is another question from the audience, but it occurred to me as well. Um, what are some of the innovations in work and workplace safety um, from the last year's experience uh, should we ensure are retained, whether they're cultural practices or corporate practices or uh, OSHA type standards? Well, I certainly think companies will be more encouraging of workers to stay home when they are sick. Uh, I hear that quite often from, um, you know, workforce executives from our member companies that everybody's taking a more serious look about uh, paid sick leave and, and making sure that flexibility is embedded into the culture. Um, I do think there's going to be just a cultural empathy for working families. Uh, I do think everybody got to see kids and dogs uh, on calls. <laughs> Year, especially me with a four and a two-year-old, 
Um, so I do think there's just going to be more of an acceptance that people have children, people have lives, and they might have to intersect with their work. And I do think there's going to be more, like I said, empathy from business leaders about that dynamic. And I'll also add, I think that um, moving forward, you know, the pandemic really lifted up things like premium pay and hazards pay, hazard pay. And I think um, things like a living wage is going to be really critical as we move forward and making sure uh, workers have enough, not just jobs, but access to good jobs. Um, I also think that, you know, without a federal OSHA standard, um, we will really probably hope get an infectious disease standard for hopefully, God forbid, we will not you know, be in another pandemic at all or anytime soon, but really recognizing um, while guidance is important, it's not enforceable. And um, we really need policies in place for workers and employers to know what to do to prevent things in an advance and not in the midst of an emergency. So I think that a lot of the things that workers and advocates have been asking for will be in place and there will be hopefully a lot less scramble and we'll have things that can protect us moving forward and that are permanent and don't we don't have to continually uh, rely on congressional action in, in times of emergency. That's good. Well, so I'd like to ask each of you for um, some last thoughts as we as we wind down our time together here. Looking back <laughs> on everything you knew about workforce policy that you didn't realize you didn't know until 14 months ago, what is it that you see coming out of this and going forward that you most would like to concentrate on uh, for your for your job and for your, your next area of policy making? Uh, Lisa, I'll start. I'll go in the same order we did to kick off with Lisa, Susan, and Shayla, and then Evan. So, Lisa, I put you on the spot first. Oh dear! I, so I'm not a workforce person. I am a health policy right. person. Right, health policy. So, as you're um, at the top. You know, I I think um, you know I I think many people sort of said, oh, the pandemic, you know, brought brought to the forefront these help, uh, you know health inequalities by race and income. And I, I, I feel very quite frustrated by that actually, because these are, um, these are issues that are, um, have been with us for, you know, decades. Centuries. And so to, to me, um, I, I think there's an opportunity because there, even though people weren't paying attention before to, since they might be now to really raise those issues around equity and 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 really the the COVID pandemic, the the disproportionate um, role that it played on um, you know communities of color really had to do with social determinants of health in many ways, like um, the kinds of jobs that people are, you know have um, through no fa fault of their mm -hmm. own, and um, or you know because of the sort of structural inequities that we have in our society. So I think for me. Um, this is just emblematic of many other things and that that go on. And I, you know, I think one of the things that that was that was good about this year in a lot of ways is that we all learned a lot. And so I think um, because this was a novel virus, we didn't know anything. And so I think I I, I think I hope that we can sort of keep that um, willingness to learn as we go um, going forward. But really, just to focus on. Um, these systemic drivers of inequality that that sort of resulted in the disparate burden um, Great. that was placed on communities Thanks. of color. Um, a few final thoughts from the other from Suzanne, Shayla, and I, Evan. Yeah, no, I mean, I think just really quickly to to Lisa's point. Yeah, I think this was a you know we we learned a lot. Policymakers learned a lot, and I think um, it you know, an equitable recovery and what that looks like uh, is, is something that policymakers are definitely um, starting to examine and starting to look at and, um, and yeah, how to help, how to help if and when the next one comes around. Shayla? Yeah, I will just quickly add, um, it's critical that we begin to pass permanent labor protections for all workers. And, and that's what's gonna move us toward a more uh, inclusive workforce. And um, that we don't wanna just go back to where we were before the pandemic towards the status quo. We want policies 
further our workforce that are um, transformative and of course equitable, but also are better. So I think that this gave us a unique opportunity to do uh, things that have never been done before. But I think the last year and a half really made us realize how much work needs to be done and that without transformative change, we'll find ourselves in the same place. So I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic for the future. Great, thanks. And Evan? Yeah, so I, I think quickly, you know, just my takeaways are, I, I was very impressed, you know, uh, by our industry and honestly by our country. I think we we have learned a lot. I think we've done a lot in the last 14 months to, to get through this pandemic. Uh, I think a, just a very in the weeds thing that I had to track last year was um, some of the policies that we wanted to push and implement uh, to recover from the pandemic weren't even possible because of outdated structures in our government, right? Outdated oh. technology. So I think, interestingly, I hope we learn from that lesson that we make investments ahead of time so that we are more nimble uh, and more dynamic in our uh, approach, hopefully not for a long time, but assuming uh, something else comes along. Thank you all so much for your insights on this topic. Um, and it's just been a great discussion. Uh, I wanna thank our panelists for joining us this afternoon. Um, make sure to join us for our next summit session starting in four minutes, uh, Policy Making Under Pressure, which is about balancing immediate need and long-term impact. Um, we'd like you to fill out our evaluation. Please open the survey module on the left of your screen to complete a brief evaluation for this event. Your feedback helps us plan future events. We take this your input very seriously. A link to the survey will also be emailed to you later today. Evan, Lisa, Suzanne, and Shayla, thank you so much for joining us today. And I appreciate everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.